वन हेलो एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू द लेटेस्ट एपिसोड ऑफ पैक टू करेक्ट so we have been uh, holding tech to get webinars for the past uh, 18 19 no uh, actually 2 years almost 2 years now this is our 23rd edition we have it every month and today our topic is one of the most interesting topics we can think of actually at practo so my name is dr nilesh madari i i lead uh, doctor engagement at practo and the topic for today is the digital future of general medicine and general surgery covid has changed the way medicine is been practiced a lot of changes came in during covid times and we are looking at how these change practices and technology push will change the digital future of how you and i practice medicine or surgery in india so to speak on this topic i have with me first i would like to introduce dr alok modi hello sir dr dr modi sir hi good evening hello namaste nice to connect to all of you yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Modi is the uh, founder and owner at uh, Kevalli Hospital in Thane. Uh, also, Doctor Modi is uh, a diabetic center in Thane. He also go. Uh, he's been work. He's been working in the uh, in general medicine. He's been a, a practicing physician for a long time, and I've seen him being very very actively involved in all, all technology uh, technology related aspects of healthcare. i've seen him on various stages speaking at various conferences as as a, as a faculty we have a lot of uh, whatsapp groups where you talk doctors connect and talk about technology trends he's always very active over there and i'm sure he'll bring a actual very interesting insight on how he has seen actually seen and used technology and how it has changed everything for him uh so we'll be listening to dr alok modi we also are Uh, having with us right now, I don't know if Doctor Doctor Manish uh, Joshi has jo- rejoined. So th- we'll also be speaking from Doctor uh, uh, hearing from Doctor Manish Joshi on this. He'll be preaching, uh, uh, speaking on the future of general surgery and how he sees technology changing general surgery. Uh, Doctor Manish is a senior uh, uh, gastroenterologist in Bangalore. He's been with Fortis for a long time over here. And he's also with, uh, joined us shortly uh, as uh, as a surgeon with Dr. Gas Surgeries, and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to Dr. Manish also. So first, I would like to invite Dr. Alok. Could you please make a presentation, sir? Thank you very much. In the first place, let me thank Dr. Nilesh and his team at Practo for this wonderful opportunity for interacting with all of you. And like the theme of the topic is connecting with, I think, scores of doctors across the country virtually, not physically. So we justifying what we are doing, and it has its own beauty and taste. So thanks for the kind introduction. And the best way to show it is to go on a virtual platform and tell you what my thoughts are on a virtual platform. So permit me to do a screen share where I just start my presentation, and we'll take it from there. So it's a small introduction about me. I focused a moved a lot into diabetes practice today beyond critical care, and uh, with that. Uh, As per international guidelines, that's a disclaimer. So this is not note on my disclaimer. I hail from Thane city. It's a wonderful city. Now we have a new Thane, which is Godbandar Road, where I'm primarily focused for my healthcare uh, work. And uh, it's one of the very famous Thane city, full of lakes and temples. So nice place to visit if you guys plan to come down to give me a pingle. And uh, so who's the person that we are talking about? What are we talking about? We are talking about us. it's high time that the civilization especially indian population realizes looks beyond celebrities and media and starts regarding us as friends you know what i'm referring to increasing violence against doctors and uh, the, the the kind of treatment which is being given to doctors by indian society needs to change we continue to be your friends and we would remain friends and this is your current assistant one of the days when you would have a nurse or probably a receptionist to help you out in your practice today you depend more on these uh, gadgets a technology to help you much better in a much more better manner than a live human being can help so again it's not replacing a human being but they give you much more value added uh, services and medicine that we will go through very soon why all this has happened wo bolte hai na necessity is the mother of invention 
All this has actually come in because of COVID. Before COVID, we were not so much into technology. Technology was more restricted to our mobiles, which was so-called as a smartphone, which is beyond a mobile, it's a mini computer. And I won't delve into that. That will be another big talk, how to use a smartphone as a smartphone. But COVID has actually creeped into our healthcare needs. It has creeped very slowly and very definitely into the way we practice as a healthcare provider and the way a patient receives our care as a patient. So that's very important to understand. COVID has made in a lot of norms on a virtual platform. And it's high time that we join the bandwagon if we don't want to be left behind. It has changed the communication channel between an employer and an employee. It has changed your interaction with your former colleagues. It has changed a lot of interactions and a lot of legal and social questions have opened up into the relationship between a doctor and a patient. It has also changed the relationship between family members. Today, more family members are communicating on a virtual platform, sitting next to each other in a bedroom, than in live communications with each other. And especially a person who's been quarantined in his bedroom, in a home in COVID, left totally the mercy of technology to communicate with his family members for any emergency needs or for any food and health and basic needs. So that's very important to understand that technology is playing a very important role. And WhatsApp, which was a mode of communication, which is the mode of communication and which would remain as a mainstream mode of communication for tomorrow, has now walked in on a professional platform. You know, there is a, a business WhatsApp available today and that is playing a big role for big business houses to communicate with their clients, to communicate between a doctor and a patient. And Practo itself is using a lot of technology. It's one of the most tech savvy company I've seen, which is in the forefront and using technology into an optimum advantage to bridge the gap between us and our patients. So thanks Practo for getting uh, everything in place. So what's technology we talk about and we keep discussing about technology replacing a bedside clinician. You've seen a lot of Hollywood and Bollywood movies talking about it, but does it really happen? Can your sensitivity the touch of your finger, the, the calmness given by your hand and the soberness and the uh, and, and the peaceness, the peace in your voice, can it ever be replaced by technology? So that's very important that a bedside clinician can never be replaced, but technology can add value to a bedside clinician. And I like to think positive and I would focus my talk in that angle rather than thinking of technology disrupting clinical medicine. So please remember that. And today, the biggest use of technology today is a communication between you and your patient on a virtual platform through your laptop or through your mobile, which is what we call as telemedicine. So you have a lot of uh, softwares and a lot of methodologies available to do this kind of communication. You have Zoom, you have Microsoft Teams, you have Google, you have Skype, you have so many. I wouldn't go into it because it's not a technological talk show. It's a medical talk show. So we would need to do that. But what platform is most commonly used? Just to walk you through the lane of history, Zoom has become a big thing today. Microsoft team has jumped up from to 75 million users today. WhatsApp has seen a bump of 40% in its usage. I'll go a little faster than the slides because I want to finish on time. Uh, Insta and Facebook have seen a huge bump because of technology disruption. I can give a big talk about the platforms that I'm comfortable with. I'm very comfortable with Zoom. I've created my own platform for my own daily consultations via Zoom. And a couple of things about Zoom, in short, you can read through the slide. It has given a, a lot of inputs for you to read. You can do a multimedia sharing. You can have a good security, which was the Zoom bombing and the Zoom hijacking, which was supposed to be present once upon a time is not there. It gives you a lot of interactive capabilities, which I've highlighted over here. Immersive host controls, engagement capacities, and advanced features and security are there in Zoom. What's most important in any platform, whether it's Google Meet or Zoom or uh, WhatsApp, whatever you use, please remember for your medical legal safety, it's better if you have a copy of the communication. If you do not have a video and audio recording of the communication, and if you get a legal notice tomorrow from your patient, you would be sitting with your thumbs dwindling with a lot of loss because you will not be able to counter the questions raised by your patient unless you have a recording because you don't have any other tool in your hand except a recording to protect you. So make sure you use a platform for your safety. And I'd just like to point out over here, a lot of pharma companies are giving you free access to various costly softwares where you can do telecommunications with your patient and doctors are doing it. But then there is no recording because a third party 
is legally not authorized to record a communication between a patient and a doctor, which is supposed to be a privileged communication. So if you're going to depend upon a third party to do your telecommunication needs, you could be playing in trouble because that communication cannot be recorded by them legally. And if you're not adopting your own means of recording, you could end up in trouble tomorrow. So make sure that you use a tool where you have the recording with you even 10 years from now, if required when called by the court of law. I would suggest you use a VPN to play as an interface between your IP address and the patient's IP address. So what is IP address? I'll just talk to you in brief in two seconds. Just as you get a letter, you have an address, you know, which mentions your room number, your flat number or your building number, your street number and all, which pinpoints the letter to your house. So your computer, every mobile computer that is on the net has got a series of numbers and dots, which is called as a IP address, internet protocol address. So the series of number like 1.81.92.103. This, this, this could be translated into www.practo.com. So, you know, it, that IP address pinpoints every single piece of merchandise, computer, laptop, mobile, Alexa, Google, whatever instrument you have as a unique IP address, which gives it its inherent position on the net. And using that address, anybody, any hacker or any, the security guys can actually boom into, zoom into where you're located in real life. So virtual private networking removes that address from you and puts you on some other address. So it masks your address. Of course, the security guys can always zoom into you. So it's not a tool to create cyber crime, but it protects you from hijackers and cyber criminals. In the sense, I'm sitting right now in Thane and Mumbai delivering the stock, but I can use an VPN in place. And if you were to track my IP address, you would realize I'm sitting in Los Angeles. So IP addresses got a lot of benefit when you move it, you can be masked into sitting into some other part of the planet and you can keep jumping from one country to the other while you're delivering the talk. That is called virtual private networking. It is being used at a hardware level by various corporates. It is also being used at a software level by various companies. Uh, just by the way, you can also use it to watch movies from Amazon and uh, Netflix, which are not of your region and not of Expert people are using it to watch certain movies and shows which they're not authorized to use because of your geography. So VPN is something that would give you a lot of legal, uh, uh, a lot of protection from a computing angle. I would play if you can put an interface in between. We can give a talk about that a little later. Just keep that in mind. Microsoft Teams is another very good of software. It can give you multiple levels. So your, your nurse care practitioner and your colleagues can join in in the telecommunication and given different levels of security, which is possible by Microsoft Teams. So obviously this becomes a tool of choice for corporates. Now, having said that and having understood a small capsule on technology, which I told you, there are a lot of challenges which are faced by a lot of physicians, which we commonly today are being called by aggregators like Practo and other companies as HCP. We today not address as doctors, we are addressed as HCPs or healthcare providers. That is our technological term given to us. And a lot of HCPs and patients and their attenders are facing challenges because of lack of good IT knowledge. Some of them are uh, some surveys which I'm taking you, I'm walking you through them. Some surveys like Ipsos and all have said that a lot of physicians are feeling solidly overwhelmed by the quantity of information that is being dished out by IT. And we physicians are have grown up from our undergraduate days, from our medical training days to feel a patient, to see the smile of a patient and let the patient see our smile and our satisfaction when we are able to deliver quality health care. So that face-to-face -face body language communication is lost in a virtual networking platform. And that is something which is very disturbing and disrupting to a physician. So that's very important. These were the two major concerns which had come out from this survey. There were some other concerns that had come out that certain groups which were vulnerable and were not able to be shielded. So, you know, what happens is you cannot decide which people should be quarantined and which should come to the hospital on an urgent basis because there is no face-to-face -face contact. There were a lot of issues about e-prescriptions being generated and medicines getting delivered. You know, when a patient comes to your clinic or to your hospital, at times you're only dispensing the medicines yourself or your nearby pharmacy or the pharmacy attached to your hospital is dispensing the medicine and you are mentally at peace. Your patient is walking out with medicines in his hand. So with virtual networking, you don't, I mean, with virtual telecommunication, you don't know when, after your prescription has been generated whether the patient is actually taking the medicines or not. So there are certain uh, disturbances that uh, most of the COVID patients were not willing to come to the hospital. Today, a lot of home care is picking up in a big way. A lot of patients are highly disinterested in coming and seeing the healthcare provider or getting scared of coming to a hospital because they feel they might get infected from other patients. So all these issues have boomed up the telecommunication. But because of that, 
a lot of appointments and delays have started happening and doctors are anxious because they don't know what is the outcome of their treatment they've given a prescription on a virtual platform they don't know what is the outcome what is happening they lose touch with the patient and the relatives these were some of the concerns that they had but still be in spite of all that the uptake of uh, technology has increased telepath and telehealth and telecommunication has come up in a big way just as we have different whatsapp groups where we chat with each other there is a gmat community where there are physicians who are very active in technology are chatting with each other and they have said that they are finding it a big bump they have found that it's very useful a tool it has decreased the cost of healthcare uh, facility i'll show that later it has reduced the time of interaction between a patient and the doctor the reimbursements have improved from the patient's care and the technology infrastructure which was really poor before covid has bumped up in a big way i i'm sure you all would agree that the 4g network speed somehow has improved drastically after covid and a lot of players have come in the market and the cost on the indian platform of 4g has come down drastically today i think nobody has a complaint that i cannot download a movie on my mobile people are happy so the technology sharpness has improved a lot because of covid and that is something which is very important so technology has taken a big bump in a positive way and we should join that bump different doctors and different hcps and different groups have different concerns as of now what the concern is most doctors feel they are not well equipped and that's why we should thank practo for giving us this opportunity so that you guys get excited and sort of stimulated to read about technology maybe connect with it connect with me uh, on a on a different platform tomorrow where we can hold probably some workshops through practo and actually guide you through how technology can be incorporated in your own clinic but most physicians feel they are ill equipped they don't have necessary expertise and training to use these tools which are actually available on your mobile and on your laptop but you don't know how to use it for doing telecommunication a lot of patients are having this concern they don't feel they can communicate on a technology platform comfortably with a doctor so they need a little kind of a hand lifting and guidance and there are certain barriers in technology like uh, which used to exist that downtime was there internet speed was not good access to internet to remote parts of the country was not there but which has been removed now so if with that all that in mind the way you would communicate with your patient ideally can be split into three different parts and i'll just rush you through these three parts the way you communicate with a patient can be split up as a face to face event which is a classic way where you actually see the patient who walks into your clinic or your hospital you see the patient's face he sees your face there is an interaction that is called f to f in medical parlance then your virtual event that you all are used to it you know we were having a lot of zoom itis and webinitis and webcast itis and you know itis is a medical term which means inflammation we were bombarded with medical talks and webcasts and web non webinars and so many of them were conducted by pharma companies and i was a part of so many talks as a faculty in the last two years so those are all virtual events where you are video conferencing you know finally you have a hybrid event where you have a mixture of both like most of the time we as faculty come physically to the conference venue and the attendees the delegates are on a virtual platform so this can also be used in real life for telecommunication which i will just show you so let's just walk you through what is all this when you're looking at a face to face event there is a lot of strength over here there's a lot of opportunity for brainstorming relationship building ultimately you want to build up a relationship with your patient on a personal level so you can't deliver a healthcare that is obviously not very much possible on a virtual platform that is very much possible on a uh, real life face to face event so networking brainstorming discussing with the patient's relative with a satisfactory body language is not possible on a virtual platform it's possible on a face to face meet and these kind of meetings provide a richer more targeted and more focused patient interactions than any virtual meeting problems patient has to come to your place you have to spend to run a hospital you have to pay the salary of a receptionist of your nurses of your staff you have to maintain the commercial electricity rate and etc so there is a lot of cost involved for you as a healthcare provider to run a face to face uh, infrastructure to do that your hospital can be shut down because of licensing reason because of riots because of weather because of uh, certain government regulations and all there could be a lot of waiting period in the consulting room depending on how heavy your practice is all those are the challenges in a face to face meet which are not present on the virtual platform virtual meeting actually brings down the cost 
and the travel, the impact on the atmosphere, I mean, the environment is reduced, less uh, pollution on the roads because less people will travel on the road. You would not travel much to go to 10 different hospitals. You can cover the business of 10 hospitals sitting on one laptop. The speed of communication is much faster. You can do 20 consultations in one hour, which you can't do in uh, probably 20 consultations in one hour in your own clinic. And subsequently, Bath, when you're doing a face-to-face -face interaction, you need to take consent from the patient that I'm recording this conversation, a patient would be quite unhappy to do that. Whereas on a virtual meet, you can put in a disclaimer and you can say, I would be recording that event, which is legally required. You're not supposed to record an event without the patient's consent. But most of the time, the patients are not prohibitive against recording because they're used to recording uh, on a communication where they're talking to you know service providers like Airtel, Geo, and many other places. You can do metrics. So aggregators like Practo and the third-party providers and statistical companies can actually quantify your interaction with the patient, the time taken, the amount of revenue which was generated, the number of patients who come from which geographical area they come, what is the satisfaction score, what are they looking for, what kind of multimedia they're looking for, all that, all that. That is not possible on a face-to-face -face meet. And very important is any kind of infection beyond COVID is restricted. On a virtual platform, the chances that you would fall sick from your patient's infection is zero. So whether the patient is suffering from COVID or influenza or rabies or whatever, there is no way you can get it. So any kind of airborne transmission of diseases is totally out. That is a big advantage to the healthcare provider. Hybrid has got both. So what is how does it play a role in uh, telecommunication? The attendant of the patient, like you're talking to XYZ as a patient, his father and mother may be sitting in a different state altogether. So you're talking to your patient in Pune when I'm consulting in Thani, but the parents may be communicating with me from Hyderabad. So all of us can communicate. So the patient could be talking to me in my clinic in Thani. He has traveled from Pune to consult me, but his parents won't pick up a flight from Bangalore or Hyderabad. So they are on a virtual platform and all four of us are talking. So that is kind of a hybrid me and gives you the best of both the words. So, you know, I'll, I'll cut short my time. So I'll just say that. Now, this was another big study done by Ipsos. It was a 21 country study. We all practice evidence-based medicine. They looked at the ownership and usage of a digital communication. They looked at the healthcare needs. They looked at the awareness and usage of telemedicine. They looked at the understanding of digital therapeutics. And they gave a lot of data. I have cut down the data to what is really required for our talk today. <clears throat> and, they, <clears throat> and they realized that Surprising, the Indian awareness is probably better or superior to the awareness of the Western world. As you can see from the figures over here, let me switch on my pointer and I'll show you. Yeah, as you can see, the Indian awareness is at part of the Western world. Sometimes it is even superior or sometimes it is sort of similar, you know, if not less. But what they found is healthcare providers use technology more for personal use than for professional use. That's very important. And this is going to change because in the Western world, people prefer to use technology for professional use more than personal use. So what was happening before the COVID era? Uh, very few people have experienced telecommunication tools. Now more people are seeing telecommunication tools. Few people used to write e-prescriptions. Now more people are writing e-prescription. Today, more people are communicating via emails and WhatsApp communications to their patients. Uh, they would stick to the traditional paper and pen kind of communication, which has moved today. Today, you have wonderful HIS, hospital information systems on your laptop, where your patient's data can be accessed by you anywhere on the planet. You can actually see the metrics of your hospital, how many patients are admitted, how many have taken treatment, what is the outcome of certain treatment on certain ICU patients of yours, how can you compare it with your colleagues' patients in 10 other different hospitals. All that kind of metrics is not possible because of HIS and telecommunication tools, which were not possible earlier. And this can go further in the future. It can catalyze into bigger reforms and acceptance by the government, policy makers, and insurance companies so that reimbursements can occur. And a qualified, quantitative, uh, logical, and substantiated improvement can be seen in telecommunications tomorrow. And the world is moving. So remember, telecommunications is disrupting technology and the way we practice. And that is a way ahead. So it's important that we get comfortable and conversant with this kind of system. I would call it as a different brand new uh, healthcare ecosystem that we need to walk into and stay inside that capsule if we want to be comfortable tomorrow. Well, these words are very true. What has been spoken by the CEO of Microsoft, uh, Satya Nadella does not need any introduction. He's a big celebrity by himself. He's heading Microsoft today. And what he said is very right. We saw two years of digital transformation in just two months, thanks to COVID. So COVID created a lot of damage to the planet, but it cleaned up the planet. It gave you a lot of wonderful things before it 
sort of left, I would say it has left the planet, of course, I'm not totally correct when I say that, but COVID has given a lot of tools and goodness to the planet before it leaves and it has disrupted the traditional healthcare system into a tech healthcare system. So the, this is your digitally savvy healthcare provider. Maybe I can qualify into that. I'm not that great a person, but there are doctors who are highly digitally savvy. People like me are writing software for our own hospital and our own mobile. We are, we are modifying our Android phone to make it our phone you know android beauty is you can androidize the phone make it personalized the way you want the phone to function so a digitally say hcp can use his finger and practically rush from a patient in brazil to uttar pradesh to maharashtra and deliver healthcare simultaneously to 20 of his patients across the globe in a very satisfactory and a very proper format i personally have done more than 3000 video consultations from my own kevalya hospital on a platform which zoom which i have modified after my subscription and i've used it to deliver a lot of e-prescriptions to my patients so i've been very satisfied another disruption of uh, technology has been healthcare business we used to collect cash earlier patients would pay by cash because of e-communication there is no way a patient would pay you by cash because if he can come to pay you by cash there could be a face-to-face -face interaction so you are paid digitally and the moment you're paid digitally taxes become mandatory so black money generation becomes very low obviously and all the telecommunications and healthcare needs that are done digitally are all on uh, digital platforms. So the number of hits on Google Pay, on Paytm, on Phone Pay have increased dramatically. The bank income in the current accounts has bumped up a lot and UPI payments have become a big mainstay of therapy, not only in medical science, but everywhere. So that is another thing. This is just a very small snapshot of how many telecommunications I've been doing in the last two to three years. And if I were to allow to show you without showing the name, I hope I don't show you the name of the patient over here for obvious reasons. But uh, if you can see, uh, I generate, uh, I generate one second. Okay, I think I generate my e-prescriptions. It's not the link is not opening up, so it's okay. Let's move ahead, and uh, you can generate a lot of e-prescriptions and send it digitally across on WhatsApp or an email to the patient and you can deliver quality healthcare. Now, before we jump into anything, before we get married to any girl or any boy, you need to keep certain norms in mind. Any new thing comes with its own, uh, you know, tirad, which you need to follow. Any new thing comes with its own capsule that you need to follow. Anything comes with its own FAQs, which you need to follow. So telecommunication is given legal parlance by the Maharashtra Medical Council in Maharashtra and by the different licensing authorities in different states, if you're practicing in India, and you should be aware of it. And these guidelines are from the central government. So you need to be aware of it and people have landed up in trouble if they don't follow this. So remember this, this is a central guideline which you need to follow and guidelines have to be strictly followed. I'll just give you in short what these guidelines say. One is you need to keep your patient data confidential. Remember you're recording the conversation, you're having an access to everything that the patient is giving you, his reports and everything, they're stored in your system and the patient may or may not be aware of that. It is up to you to, uh, to keep their confidential. If you break the confidentiality, you're creating a big mess for yourself which would not have happened if there was a face-to-face -face connect with you in the clinic or in the hospital. Understand the consent. A lot of doctors and hospitals have landed up in the National Consumer Forum of Delhi for not following the rules of consent. Patient has to allow you to do a telecommunication. Please understand this and listen to me very carefully here. This is very important. If patient refuses to do a telecommunication, there is no way you can force a patient to do a telecommunication. If in the middle of a telecommunication, he says, I would like to come down and do a face-to-face -face consultation, you cannot prevent it from doing that. So you need to give importance to a face-to-face -face communication if the patient so desires. Otherwise, the consent is mandatory. Now, implied consent means that you don't have to take a written consent from, from the patient. Okay, look, I'm ready to do a telecommunication or a teleconsultation with you. The moment he pays your charges, he's ready to do that. It becomes an implied consent, which gives you legal safety. But anytime he's at a liberty to break that consent and convert it to a physical consultation, whatever information you get, you cannot use it to self-promote yourself on Facebook, WhatsApp or social media. That is considered a breach of law. So don't do that. Please keep an audio and video recording, which I've already discussed for your own safety for medical legal purposes in the future. It's mandatory. Very few doctors know that you have to be trained by Maharashtra Medical Council and your regional uh, licensing authority in telecommunication. You need to get a certificate from them. If you have not undergone training, buy them and collected a certificate from them. Your telecommunication may be considered illegal in the court of law. So please remember that. You cannot prescribe sedatives and class 4 drugs which are listed out in the protocol which I just showed you. If you go through that 20 to 30 pages PDF, which I can share if you need 
me to share it with you. It's very clearly mentioned that sleep medicines, narcotics, and certain drugs cannot be prescribed on a telecommunication, even if they're indicated. They can be prescribed only after face-to-face -face consultation. Two doctors from New Delhi are facing a legal suit today by the patient who has been vindicated in the murder of a very famous celebrity in the recent past. I'm not taking names. You understand whom I'm referring to. This Bengali uh, celebrity has implicated two doctors for prescribing sedatives on a telecommunication. So remember that doctors have landed up in trouble. You cannot prescribe narcotics and sedatives on a telecommunication. Make sure that you preserve the confidentiality of your patient data and give it a lot of holy importance. What kind of tools are you going to use? Obviously, you're going to use a software. You need a very good broadband system. Besides that, there are a lot of wonderful tools. You have the stethoscope. You have an ECG machine. You have an app given by Eco Company. I'll walk through them very fast. This is the digital stethoscope, which the patient can keep on his chest. And you can hear all the heart sounds and the respiratory sounds. Even if you're sitting some 5,000 kilometers away, you can. he can use his own digital stethoscope and ECG machine. He can record his own ECG with his own hands. And you can have a direct wireless communication through different mechanism. So different stethos, different thermometers, different sensors are available in the market, which I will show you, which will push in all the data in a very systematic and a logically and a scientific accurate manner to you. And you can collect that data and come to your own diagnosis and treatment strategies. So Stethi, Eco, these are different companies which are doing it. You have digital thermometers, you have infrared thermometers, which you are aware of, you have seen that. I'll come to that a little later. There is a software called Fever, which was incorporated in Albert Einstein Hospital. And this is such a wonderful software that when, in India, when you go to the mall or you go to a cinema hall or you go to a hotel there, the security puts a thermometer in front of you on your forehead and senses whether you're having temperature or not. So whether you should be allowed inside the premises or not. In this kind of a software system in Brazil and in Albert Einstein Hospital, they could measure the temperature from a remote area. So you just walk into the hospital and the software is measuring through different scattered sensors for every person who's walking into the hospital, whether he has fever or not. And if you walk into the hospital with a fever, with nobody screening you, you would be picked up, caught and pushed out. So that is a kind of a technology disruption which has happened in the Western world. It is in real life and it gives you an entire safety and immunity to the entire hospital. Now, there has been a lot of talk about the accuracy of non-mercury thermometers, which are your digital thermometers, but a lot of data is there. This is the Malaysian data, which I can, which I've shared with you. <coughs> which has found that they are quick, they are easy to use, they are safe because they are non-mercury and they are accurate. So you can use them with full confidence. The only thing is there were some concerns that that could damage your pineal gland or the third eye or your brain because of infrared rays. And study has shown very clearly that such things do not happen. No, the disadvantage of an infrared or a digital thermometer is that it has to be brought very close to your forehead. So the person who's taking it has to come close to your face. So what kind of you know, social distancing you're going to maintain. So might as well use a mercury and put it in his mouth because you're anyway coming very close to the patient's face. So that is a disadvantage. The purpose of an infrared or a digital thermometer was so you can take the temperature from a distance, which actually does not happen. If you want to be accurate, you have to be pretty close to the patient's forehead or uh, the ear lobe or the, the, the tympanic membrane. So you don't want to come so close to an infected person. That was only a disadvantage. There are multiple devices. I'm using all kinds of devices which are used by the patient to record a 12 lead ECG very accurately and transferable to your laptop or to your mobile wirelessly or via Bluetooth or via Wi-Fi. And that data can be transmitted across the world. If you're not a cardiologist, you can share the data with me or some other person who is a specialist and he can give you the interpretation live within less than 10 seconds. And quality healthcare can be delivered immediately. And this has got the approval of medical literature, as you can see. You can see the technology behind it. Now I'll move ahead and I'll show you certain sensors. Like this is a throat patch. I'm rushing fast on these slides because I'm just trying to highlight what is present rather than going into the elaboration of technology because we do not have that kind of time. You have smart patches uh, which are offering potential for remote monitoring of COVID-19 patients. Boston is using this AI artificial intelligence and remote monitoring sensors on the chest. Life signals biosensor is another sensor which is approved by US FDA. It gives you a two channel EKG. It gives you a heart rate, respiratory rate, the temperature of the skin, motion accelerometer. It connects directly to the COVID-19 app launched by the company. It lasts for five days. It is 
uninfected, uh, it is hygienic, it, can, it is shower proof, you can take shower with this app running live and you can go swimming and it is lightweight, it does not cause any kind of side effects or skin damage once it is applied. So such kind of sensors are now being used in the Western world very regularly. This is another sensor uh, made by Vital Patch, it measures a QT interval. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember when we were using erythromycin and when we were using different toxic drugs, which prolong the QTC in COVID patients, they're not recommended anymore. But when we are using such kind of drugs, which prolong the QTC and they were hydroxychloroquine, there were so many concerns about causing uh, heart uh, damages because of QT prolongation. And if you're on certain other medications like antiarrhythmics, et cetera, the combination could be fatal. So these are the kind of patches which would tell the healthcare provider, Ki, look, the patient's QTC is getting prolonged or not. So you can decide to cut down the dose sitting from 5,000 kilometers away. Just to highlight, since we are Indians, we are proud of our colleagues, our, our uh, own citizens. Arun Jairaman sitting in US has developed his own sensor, which has been approved by US FDA. And wonderful thing, it monitors your cough. So, you know, if a person is sitting in the room and is coughing very lightly, a senior citizen or a kid is coughing very softly, the, his parents or his care providers may not be able to hear that cough because he's an isolated in the room in this nearby room. So this kind of sensors actually pick up cough and tell you. So you can just move through, I'm running short of time. So in India, coming to India, this is the startup and AI Healthcare has raised 12.5 crores to come out with similar technology, similar app and similar kind of system. And Bioformis is a wonderful IT technology where it does an artificial intelligence sensing and gets all this data, churns it up and makes meaningful observations out of it. What is that observation? I'll come to that. And these kind of observations are such wonderful things that what they do is they tell you that this patient can land up in the ICU five days from now. This patient can land up with tachycardia four days from now. This patient is cough is worsening. So you please put him in the hospital, even if his saturation is 98%. So this kind of algorithm that AI does is available in certain healthcare systems through these sensors. And that makes life really good for the patient and the healthcare provider because the mortality comes down. So, so many sensors I'm just showing you, they've been approved by US FDA. And like I said, this is how the ecosystem of a sensor works. It can monitor your food intake, your drug intake, your medicine intake, your water intake, your teeth uh, health, your body vitals, your overall health. It discusses whether you have communicated on time with your healthcare provider or not, whether you have actually slept well or not. All those things are monitored and given to you on a platter to the healthcare provider who can just see and say, fine, patient A is healthy, patient B is not healthy, patient C is little less healthy, and all this can be taken care of. So you can see how much technology has moved ahead. And yet I'm saying technology cannot replace you. And I think I'm making sense in what I'm saying. Australia has its own uh, Arugya Setu app, as you can see, has picked up a lot of COVID patients. Arugya Setu is our Indian app, which has picked up a lot of COVID patients. The only problem with Arugya Setu was <coughs> the government didn't tell us, but there have been concerns that your patient's data would not remain confidential. It was shared across multiple personalities. This is the kind of ecosystem that is existing in the market today, where a person is going to develop shortness of breath and would need hospitalization and ICU care right on day two, a healthcare provider can make out through the artificial intelligence and can move ahead. This is what we call as siliconization. I will tell you what is siliconization. And this is what we call as integrated analytics. Based on all this data that you are collecting, if all your data is pooled across the country, the government can make out that so-and-so village in Maharashtra is going to have an epidemic after seven days. So China and US could make out that so-and-so district or so-and-so city is going to have an epidemic after 10 days, you know. So that is a kind of technology disruption that has occurred. It can identify problems at risk individuals and at risk communities. That is very important. Another side effect or a good effect or whatever of this technology disruption was Zomato, Swiggy, food providers bumped up like anything. A lot of people were quarantined, a lot of contactless deliveries at home had to be done at hospitals, at COVID hospitals had to be done. And a lot of bump up of technology of food delivery and medicine delivery started and the orders were all covered by technology. In India, we are not behind. Robots are there in India, which collects temperature, collects the phone number, name, and photograph of the patient, and even sets up a video communication appointment with your healthcare provider directly. And these robots can go and sanitize the entire room where you're water by and you don't have to go. It takes pictures of visitors and finds out that if you're infected, are your family members infected or not? That is the kind of a work a robot can do, which you cannot do as a healthcare provider. So the risk has come now. And this kind of system was actually in place in AIMS, in Fortis Group of Hospital, Apollo Group of Hospitals, and the Jumbo Healthcare COVID Center in Bandra in Mumbai. 
So there were four robots that uh, Milagro had launched in India, Robo DiCaprio, Robo Julia, Robo Nano and Robo Elf. And they were serving different purposes. Robo Elf was a service assistant. Robo Caprio worked as a relationship front desk manager to welcome you as a patient. Robo Julia would deliver the needs of uh, food and medicines and explain to them what is the menu from the restaurant today. So it could work in the restaurant as well as in the hospital. And all this was set up to work from Amazon's Alexa voice service. And this was being used from the Kerala startup mission under SM of robotics. And this is just a snapshot of what kind of a robot was working in this makeshift COVID hall, Chennai banquet hall in New Delhi, where this robot would come and deliver medicine, thermometer, healthcare equipment, and food to the patients and the healthcare provider on the wick of a command. This is another robot which can actually welcome you, take your temperature and your photo and your statistics and guide you through to the respective doctor in the hospital. Ognito is a very well recognized software because of IT technology. What it does is when your uh, CT scan, your MRIs are being generated, your radiologist reports out on a voice recording system, which the reception sits at each the next day and converts it into a text format, which is what you see as a printed report. Ognito bypasses that and Ognito directly converts uh, spoken speech to text. And to just tell you that feature is available on your mobile today. You don't have to have a 70,000, 80,000 rupees car mobile. Even a 15,000 rupees mobile is inbuilt voice AI system available at your doorstep in your own hand with your own mobile because of Google, but we don't use it. Your Office 365, if you're having an official copy of Office, has got a voice to text interface built in, which is around 80 to 85% accurate. And I use it regularly to chart my letters, to draft my emails, to I just talk to my laptop and my work is done in less than one twentieth of my time than to tap, tap, tap on my keyboard. And this system is actually being used in the Chennai Hospital and RT Labs, Sarvodaya Hospital in Delhi, Beach Candy Hospital in Mumbai, SVS Medical College in Hyderabad. Dr. Aditya Shetty, a reputed consultant radiologist at Beach Candy said, the experience of Ognito was groundbreaking. So COVID-19 has converted a lot of healthcare facility into technological facility. And there was a newspaper item where Dr. Lakadawala said, okay, this is not a hospital, it is a hospital. He could convert every hotel in the vicinity into a hospital because of technology. And a senior citizen who was walked into 26 senior citizens in that dome said they were scared that doctors were not there and technology was giving everything. And they walked out alive and healthy and recovered and they were happy with the technology system. Another form of technology, just five more minutes, Dr. Manish, I'm finishing. Uh, the plug and play ICUs, you can have an actual, like you can plug a charger into your mobile. You can, the clue system, which is there, you can take the entire ICU with the entire infrastructure. You can plug it into the patient's bedroom at his house or in your hospital and convert into a totally contactless, highly equipped ICU. It's running live in Fortis and Apollo hospitals. You can see the photo here of an ICU in Fortis Mulund over here. And the advantage is mortality, fever, morbidity has come down by 40 to 60%. Patient care is 24 by 7 in real time. Bed utilization has come down by 30%. Algorithm decide kaan pe kya lagana hai and how do you go about it. In India, we are having, sorry, across the world, you are having 173 licensed startups which are using technology in healthcare. What is silico analysis? It's nothing that the algorithms can actually predict what would be the outcome of certain diseases? Robotics, like I say, can pinpoint you down from the satellite, can bring you down to one single patient scattered in some part of the city whose fever is growing up and who needs to be shifted to a healthcare facility. Robots are running the entire medicine disposal system, taking temperature, taking blood pressure, everything in the healthcare facility. Doctors and nurses are not required. India has its own 62 apps to deal with COVID, but they're more or less similar. Nothing big to talk about them. Drones are another healthcare facility with Amazon and all, which are using artificial intelligence to deliver medicines, deliver healthcare and deliver food. And digital face is another new technology which can identify faces of COVID positive patients at airports and different healthcare facilities and make sense out of it and can aid. And Dubai was using it quite regularly. So I'll move ahead. There's a lot I can talk about, a lot, lot I can talk about, but there is a lot of work which can be spoken about technology in healthcare, not just in COVID and everywhere. The only thing is there is a lot of concern about data privacy. That's a big topic by itself. I won't touch upon it today because it will take a lot of time. But if you're using technology, you can do epidemiological monitoring, surveillance, real-time mapping, role model prediction, 
and prediction analytic tools, which is very important. And all this is available on your mobile. You don't have to download an app. You just know how to use it. If you use it well, you can do wonders out of it. Cloud computing is what I'm using in my own hospital. You buy a cloud as at cheap as 3000 to 2000 rupees per month. You can do an entire computing need your entire uh, database analytic systems, patient record keeping systems and prediction analysis right on the cloud without buying a heavy computer. You buy a simple model, a simple client and everything is possible through a server which acts as a cloud computing on Amazon or Alexa or somewhere else. I'm not going to Alexa, sorry, on Amazon and there are different other clouds which are working as data computing clouds which are different from storage clouds which your, your Google Drive and OneDrive are giving you. You can use a virtual technology platform to have a multimedia richness in your interaction with your patients. And tomorrow is a day of 5G network. Once 5G network comes in, technology would get a boost in the arm. The amount of deployment time and the recovery time would be very high. Last thing about technology is Internet of Things, which is being used very regularly, where your refrigerator, your stethoscope, your ECG machine, your monitor in the ICU, they all talk to each other. So patient walks in from the ICU to the ward to the operation theater. The communication of the healthcare needs goes from one machine to the other. And the doctor from this end has communicated via the machine to the doctor at the other end. And all the data seamlessly walks through different platforms and your entire data walks in from one monitor to the other through what is called as IoT Internet of Things. Cybersecurity is a big thing. I won't talk about it. What they have done is they've done a blockchain technology. They restrict the data to each block. So only necessary data can walk in from block to block so that the entire system does not disrupt. I'll just move through fast certain things which I have learned in my own interaction in the last three years. Do I have time, uh, Nilesh sir, or should I stop over here? Uh, Dr. Modi, sir, a, a few minutes are perfectly fine. Three, four minutes, perfect, perfectly fine. fine. Just some, some from my own experiences. There is a yet a lot of technology barrier for patients. So just as we give a little amount of counseling to our diabetes patient, we just don't give them prescriptions. Talk a little bit. Give thirty seconds to guide your patient how to come on a Zoom platform, how to unmute yourself, how to switch on a video. Because a lot of senior citizens who are left alone and their children are in US, they face this challenge quite a lot. Thoda sa unko help karoge. They can pick it up. Rural patients from who are not so educated can pick up, but they pick up faster. They just need a little hand from you. I have seen a couple of medical practitioners taking telecommunications very casually. They sit with a very casual dress, not a formal dress. They don't give a right body language. So you need to be careful about that. I've also seen patients having a very unpresentable behavior on a technology platform. They feel they're talking from their home and their positions are very embarrassing. So just make sure that the necessary protocols and decency and grooming is maintained. The wonderful technology, you see my room from where I'm talking. This is not my real room. It looks like I'm talking from California. It is not the case. It's a virtual background that I've generated. So you could very well sit in a slum and show to the world that you're sitting in a five-star hotel in Dubai and doing your consultation. Advantage of technology. In the virtual world, you can hide your reality behind the computer screen. In real life, you can't do that. Your body language can throw you out if you're trying to deceive your patient. But in virtual reality, you can do that to a little extent. But my suggestion to you would be not to get used into a bad body language. Have a body language which is decent, formal, and predictable, and which is soothing to your patient. Advantages, you can do the consultation at one o'clock in the night, which you probably would not like to do in your hospital at that time. You don't have to rush to your hospital for every patient who walks in beyond your consulting time. You can cover to patients across the country, beyond the country. So when my patient is taking my therapy for diabetes and Fane, when he moves to US for six months, my consultations continue. My patients are in Australia, Dubai and all, they continue consulting with me thanks to technology, which was not possible a few years back. Patients who are consulting me from Ghatkopar or Chembur or Mumbai take three hours to come down to Thane. I tell them, don't come down, let's do a virtual consultation. They are happy, I'm happy. I don't have to take the, I don't have to get uh, unhappy patients. There's a line of 20 patients in my consulting room that can be cut down because I'm doing a virtual consultation. So body language is very, very important. And so just to show you that there is a lot of data which says that Professor Mera Bennett said that 93% of body language is non-verbal. It's only 7% which your brain picks up, which is verbal. So whatever I'm talking to you, you're picking up 90% which is verbal, but actually you're looking at my image on your computer and getting better feelers out of that. So brain picks up more of non-verbal communication. So remember in virtual technology, people feel verbal communication is existing. Body language ka component nahi hai. That is wrong. Your body language component is there and you should make attention to that. 
don't think it is a one way traffic it remains a two way traffic and it should remain a two way traffic you're responsible for your behavior online and offline you're responsible for your body language you're responsible to portray the right message the right tone of voice the right sumerity when you're chatting and you're communicating on any platform remember you're presenting yourself as a doctor you're putting the entire industry of this country at risk because of your behavior you can depend only on smileys and images on certain platforms like whatsapp and instagram so they are not very good platforms for a proper consultation so try not to use them for a formal communication and whatsapp should not be the official mode of communication as far as legality is concerned if you're using an online platform you can push a lot of multimedia rich content you can explain the disease to the patient in a much better manner but at the end of it do welcome your patient to come some day to the clinic shake hands with you meet you face to face and have a live interaction with you to show them what kind of a warm personality you are and give them a knowledge as to what kind of a warm personality they were so that at the end of the day you can hug you can shake hands leave with a smile and make a real good job of a proper consultation which is either offline or online so i'm sure i have just done one thing that i've excited you guys to read more about what is technology i'm sure dr nilesh and his team at practo would be very happy to help you with that get on board sir welcome sir and madam to technology platform take it ahead move with the times and use it in a proper manner supervisory manner and give better healthcare to your patients in a more dignified manner that's all i'll tell you and again i'd like to thank all of you to who were tolerating me very patiently for the last 35 minutes or so and dr manish looking forward to hearing you and at the end a lot of thanks to dr nilesh and his team the organizers at practo for picking me up for today's talk thank you very much for this honor and have a great day and a great weekend thank you dr alok sir uh, thanks a lot and it was definitely a master class and maybe next time we can have a workshop where we pick up a specific topic from within this vast universe that you have shown us and do a workshop for doctors on that and uh, i would like like the audience to ask questions if they have in the uh, youtube chat so if you have specific questions on how you could use technology to solve any of your particular issues you could ask dr alok now and maybe we could help you live after this session on uh you know after this presentation on actually how you could use the normally available uh, tools to improve your practice so next now i would like to call dr manish we had introduced him earlier but uh, unfortunately he was temporarily not available in zoom at that time so i'll just uh, welcoming uh, uh, again uh, hello dr manish joshi welcome back hello uh, can you hear me yes dr manish you're totally uh, audible and visible everything is good so dr manish joshi is a senior gi surgeon in bangalore uh he is working with a lot of hospitals around here he is the director of prospel institute of gastro sciences at prospel hospitals bangalore he is with fortus recently he has also been with uh, practo care surgeries trained in bangalore uh, minakshi mission hospital uh, uk uh, wide experience and he will be talking about how he sees technology uh, technology changing the future of surgery 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 as a practice so dr manish if you could uh, present your screen a uh, fantastic uh, talk dr alok modi and uh, uh, thank you dr nilesh bandari for this opportunity thank you practo technologies uh, so uh, dr alok modi is a typical mumbai indian uh, pace bowler an opening bowler and he is uh, i'm happy that he has taken away the power play away from the opponents and uh, i would come in typically as a royal challengers bangalore uh, spinner or a uh, uh medium pacer uh, let me just put it as a spinner so you can differentiate from a fast bowler to a spinner and i would like to uh, start sharing my screen uh, and probably you will be able to make out the difference between physicians full of knowledge versus surgeons full of different set of skills if you are able to see my screen then uh, just let's begin so <clears throat> i have conveniently taken away uh, the digital part of the topic given to me because we as surgeons were the only ones couldn't work from home in this covid pandemic and i'm just going to throw a few googlies at the audience here mainly consisting of doctors and medical fraternity 
and showcase uh, what exactly uh, the future is going to look like. I'm not a predictor, I'm not the right person, but maybe we'll have some glimpses of uh, what could lie ahead in the future, or at least what areas of our lives as surgeons are going to change in the coming future or the days ahead. So bring greetings from Bangalore. Uh, as I said, again, I've conveniently taken away the word digital from my talk, and I'm just going to look back as to how the entire thing has evolved. And it is always said that if you look back far enough, you can always look ahead far ahead as well. So looking back, this was a book which was ahead of its times. And the author Alvin Toffler in his book, uh, Future Shock, wrote this interesting quotation, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And this is as especially true in the field of uh, surgery as well, because things have been changing. Initially, it took decades for things to change, techniques to change and other things to change. Now it is so rapid uh, that we need to keep updated every now and then, otherwise we'll be lost or will be way behind others. So the first thing I would like to talk about the future of uh, surgery would be the technique part. So we have the same diseases, we have the same problems, but the way that technique is changing is what we need to look at. And the earlier we adapt to newer technologies, we try and innovate, we come up with something better always. And the whole uh, idea of innovation, adaption, as well as this talk is, uh, is not to differentiate between what is right and wrong anymore. Uh, the whole uh, purpose of evolving and adapting is to now look at what is more right or what is more better for this particular condition or what is more appropriate so it's no longer a question of right or wrong. It is about right or more right, good or better. And in technique, uh, just highlighting a few things. Uh, this is a patient of a fistula in ANO. So usually this is the traditional uh, way the fistula surgery happens. We probe it, we identify the external opening, the internal opening, uh, just to give a highlight as to how things are. So the disease remains the same. The diagnosis more or less is also uh, evolving, but the technique is what has changed over the last decades and is going to change in the future as well because of newer and newer innovations. So these are a couple of ways of dealing with the same patient who had the fistula. So on the left-hand side, my left-hand side screen, you can see the laser tip going in and the laser surgery happening. Whereas on the other side, there is a circular blade which has come up as an innovation technology through which uh, the entire fistula track can be taken out through the circular blade. So, uh, so again, the technique keeps changing and is evolving, but the disease process is the same. The disease or the condition remains the same. So whether it's laser, whether it's newer uh, uh, instruments, the technique always looks for giving something better to the main stakeholder, which is the patient, either in, form, in the form of painless approach or in the form of uh, less recurrence and high success rates. So we also look back at what exactly are the traditional methods we have been uh, trained with and open suturing or the traditional method is always the gold standard because it brings about the foundation for everything else. And only when you have the foundation strong on that you build bigger buildings or taller buildings. 
and you can easily adapt to newer changes. So again, the disease process remains the same. The approach could be open suturing. It could be laparoscopic suturing. It could be robotic suturing, which has become much, much better because of advanced te uh, technique. The disease remains the same. The process remains the same. But the entire shift is towards how to make it better for the patient. So this is a, a patient with a laparoscopic fundoplication, uh, which helps uh, severe GRD patients who are uh, recalcitrant on uh, medical therapy. And with this kind of a fundoplication, you can give relief for the severe GRD patients. And this can be done, this is a laparoscopic view, but this has been now, uh, we had started doing it uh, with the robotic uh, unit as well. So it's all a matter of adopting new things adapting to new things and keeping the mind open so someone wisely said keep your mind open and your options open like a parachute then you will always look at and try to adapt and get something better for yourself or for your patient so one we talk, uh, talked about is the technique the second important thing i think is again a t is technology so I'll be talking about four T's. We have talked about technique. Second is technology. I'm, uh, I'm very happy that Dr. Alok Modi spoke about technology a lot, uh, but this is from a surgeon's perspective. I told you uh, difference between a pace bowler and a, a spinner. So we have this uh, diagnostic laparoscopy being done for a patient who has been identified on a CT scan imaging for bleeding to have a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And because of this uh, uh, technology, we are able to identify clearly, precisely. And now we are just identifying uh, the length of the small intestine, which we need to resect and anastomose. So we need to adapt to the newer technology and give the benefit of the newer technology to the patient. So again, the diseases remain same and some of these diseases are a bit overwhelming. So this one is a peritoneal carcinomatosis. So you can see the jelly belly uh, parts which are stuck to the entire peritoneum and the, uh, the jelly, bell, uh, jelly uh, material in the peritoneum as well. Difficult to put in the ports as well. Now, <clears throat> though we are trying newer technology, the disease process itself is so overwhelming that we can definitely have a diagnosis, but probably we might have to go back to the old standard of doing uh, open laparotomy and trying to get this patient uh, disease condition uh, rectified. So you need to have all, all options. And if you're better skilled at all the options, you can choose what is best for the patient. It doesn't mean that the newer technology itself is going to be the best. Sometimes you have to fall back on what is the old traditional open method as, as well. So again, uh, Dr. Olak Modi talked about something hybrid, uh, both virtual as well as uh, physical uh, consultations. Here also we have option of initially doing a diagnostic laparoscopy using newer technology and identifying this uh, large mesenteric cyst uh, you, you, you just saw the appendix there and this is the large mesenteric cyst being seen. So the options are always there when you're skilled in uh, multiple technologies, whether to continue doing this laparoscopy or is it safe for the patient or to do a hybrid thing, mobilize everything laparoscopically and then make a small incision and bring out the entire cyst out. So ultimately the idea is to do what is best for the patient, what is best for the disease condition and what will give better outcomes. So whether it's old technology, new technology, or whether it's a hybrid, we need to work with the patient in mind and with the best outcomes, with the patient's best interests in mind. So <clears throat> moving on to other parts of technology, which has uh, uh, come up in a big way in the last decade, and I'm sure things are only going to improve in the coming decades. Uh, 
it took almost 30 to 50 years uh, for the staplers to be uh, medically usable. But since it has come into vogue, it has become a mainstay of any and most of the surgical techniques. And if you can see that it's only evolving and getting better and better. So with a bloodless uh, uh, stapling line with newer technologies, we can try and take out the intestines. We can use it for multiple uh, organs, systems and multiple tissues as well. And now it has come, this is a straight uh, linear cutter. We can also, we also have curved staplers. We also have uh, staplers for hemorrhoids. We also have uh, uh, curved staplers to match the curve of the pubis when we are doing rectal cancer surgery. So a lot of uh, advancement in technology has happened and it's only going to get better and better. And uh, the only worry with increasing technology or increasing use of technology is the increasing cost, which is one thing that as Indians, we need to look at how to innovate and make the most of it so that we can deliver cost effective healthcare to each and every patient, each and every Indian patient. So the same thing what we have done uh, by open stapler, we are now doing by robotic approach. So you can see the robotic surgery unit, the robotic arms going in and dissecting, the surgeon sitting at the robotic console and operating. Uh, so this is not only comfortable for the surgeon to be sitting and operating, uh, not having shoulder aches, not having the strain on the legs, not having any back pains during the long procedures uh, while the surgeon is sitting on the robotic console. But it is also beneficial for the patient that the entire uh, magnification makes the entire surgery much more safer, much more bloodless and hopefully painless as well. Uh, this adapting and adopting to newer technologies comes with a cost. And as I said earlier, uh, we need to be able to uh, cut down the cost to make it more affordable, more reachable to the entire population. So ultimately the disease is the same, whether we do open surgery, whether we do uh, laparoscopic surgery or whether we do robotic approach or we do the transanal endoscopic approach, the specimen, the cancer surgery has to be optimum. The specimen should be of a radical uh, dissection as well as it should have all the tenets of a safe oncological principles. So technology is only adopting to the disease process and make it more comfortable for the patient or uh, in terms of either recovery or patient outcomes, it has to be better. I'm just going to show a few more videos and then uh, uh, leave some thoughts behind for everybody. So there's a lot of uh, advances in uh, technology in the endoscopic era as well. So whether it's uh, doing uh, endoscopic uh, transanal surgery or whether it's a bedside uh, flexible endoscopy, uh, we can, the newer technologies are going to make it much more easier to do most of the things at the bedside in the ICU or wherever it is needed for an unfit patient as well as in the OR as well. The only mindset that we need to change is uh, to adopt and to be open for newer technologies. I would rather say embrace new technologies as early as possible because things are only going to improve like we see the versions of iPhone. Uh, even all these medical devices are only going to improve with their next versions. Improvement can be in terms of uh, usage, it, improvement can be in terms of cost as well. There's uh, some more devices which are coming up, which are now started uh, using it, which help endoscopic suturing as well. So you see a double channel scope there, uh, which uh, I've been training to try and do the suturing. So uh, the peptic ulcer perforations, the small leaks, the Borau's uh, syndrome, uh, Mallory V stare, wherever there is a perforation in the stomach or in the colon or in the intestine, these devices can be used 
this we are currently using it for endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty which is uh, doing uh, for morbid obesity patients we are doing this endoscopic uh, sleeve gastroplasty procedures and technology again uh, we are trying to be ahead and adapting to the technology as soon as it comes uh, but it comes with a cost and i again uh, feel that the cost is the one thing uh, prohibitive otherwise everybody would easily adapt the technology whether it's a metro city or a tier 2 city or a tier 3 city so the covid pandemic has left the world a bit more fatter and it's going to be a bigger challenge as india gets into more and more economic abundance that all the patients and all the uh, population is growing fatter so we have seen the uh, bariatric surgery we have seen the endoscopic surgery technique now this is a gastric swallow balloon pill which is the latest in the market where you just insert it over a guide wire and make the patient drink some water and the pill goes and sits into the stomach and the procedure is done and there is a 500 ml of normal saline uh, which will inflate the entire gastric balloon inside the stomach so this apparently is also going to cause weight loss and the uh, gastric swallow balloon will automatically in 6 months time deflate and allow the normal saline to pass through and the balloon will uh, come out through the nat natural pa passage so technology is only improving further but again the cost is the one thing which is uh, a hurdle in adapting these newer technologies <coughs> so whether you look at the disease condition remains the same the technique is changing the technology is changing and make it more and more comfortable for the patient so the results end results is the same uh, but if you are moving towards uh, non invasive surgery or minimal invasive surgery then it is more and more uh, uh, acceptable by the general population so the last <clears throat> i said i would be talking about four t's the third t is uh, the first t was technique second was technology third is training and if you if i forget you can ask me the last t uh, i've just kept it uh, out of the slides so the training is the next uh, part which is going to change dramatically in the medical field we already have simulators we already have uh, uh, mannequins we have these in house workshops in person workshops where everybody gets to learn the skills as well as the dry labs and the cadaveric labs so this is the endoscopic sleeve uh, uh, workshop that we recently organized and this is for uh, uh, morbidly obese patients where we do endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty and try and uh, reduce the size of the stomach to a small sleeve like tube which helps in the weight loss so the technology is new and here we are all in the training where it's a in person training and a hands on training and with the covid uh, we also have uh, been digitally fast tracked into lot of uh, digital uh, webinars and digital uh, access to lot of experts across the globe so here you can see uh, dr abu dai barham from mayo clinic rochester uh, giving a talk to the entire uh, course delegates sitting from the comfort of his home so there is a blend of both hybrid as well as uh, uh, both in person as well as uh, uh, virtual training which can happen and nowadays the hybrid model is also very uh, acceptable by most of the audience and it saves a lot of cost and we can get the experts uh, across the globe so this is uh, the new uh, type of training which is happening in the medical colleges uh, and many of the universities and top notch medical colleges have started using the simulation mannequins uh, instead of doing it on real patients this is 
easily uh, reproducible skill on the mannequins, which they can use it in their uh, regular emergency scenarios as well. So this is a uh, emergency trauma uh, for general surgeons that we had conducted uh, in the Bangalore Medical College Skills Lab. And you can easily see that at, by the end of the three-day course, uh, the entire trainees are well-versed in what to do if a real-life scenario occurs. So the training is the one thing which is going to change and more and more simulator, uh, simulation and mannequins models are going to come in place uh, to get a hands-on feel of what exactly to be in a similar or a simulated scenario. I'm coming to the last few slides. Uh, I've talked about uh, the general surgery training, the general surgery technologies and the techniques which are ever evolving and I'm looking at uh, uh, a host of new things coming up in this decade and the only challenge is whether we are ready to adapt, whether we are ready to take up the new technology or we feel that it is for the new generation. I again go back to the future shock uh, written by Alvin Toffler and his uh, quote this book was written in the 1990s and I'm amazed how early on he predicted that the future is going to change. And this is one of the fantastic quotes by him. Change is the process by which the future invades our lives, whether we like it or not. So change is the only constant thing that is happening. Embrace change. And that is the only way to uh, ride the wave or to uh, be with the future, otherwise we'll be left far behind. So let me just, uh, before we, I do this uh, video, uh, this is the last video from my side. I just wanted to uh, throw a googly at all the audience here. Uh, we are all talking about newer technologies, newer techniques, newer training methods. Uh, <clears throat> ultimately, if it is only going to add cost, add time and add only extra medical equipment and medical infrastructure or investment, it might not make a difference to many lives. So we also need to innovate in a way, especially for the Indian population, where it should make a difference to many lives. And Dr. Alok Modi showed a few uh, Indian innovations as well during the COVID pandemic, which has made a difference. And with that, I would like to uh, show this, uh, which can depict what I actually am trying to say. My wife is an ophthalmologist and she recently shared this uh, video and it made, uh, uh, I was very happy with the coincidence that I was talking on the future of general surgery and I was looking for something to qualify for this sentence. Will it make a difference to many lives? And this aptly uh, got the point across. Um, I'm at the end of my talk and I'm happy to take questions and uh, uh, any comments as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, thank you for that very uh, uh, interesting talk. And thank you for your patience, firstly, because uh, we had to make you wait for some time. Uh, one thing, uh, I'll start with you because you just uh, finished your presentation, uh, Dr. Manish, I'll start with you. 
one thing I picked up from your talk is you stressed upon this there being a very large cost factor, which might uh, deter doctors from uh, adopting uh, new technologies in surgery. So I would like to ask you: Do you think doctors, surgeons, are not very interested in uh, adopting new technologies because of the cost, or are, are there other factors, or surgeons really don't mind uh, adopting new technologies? What do you think? Um, yeah. So let me put it across in a different way. Uh, no, Dr. Manish, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Could you stop sharing your screen, please? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, uh, I've done it. Please, yeah. Please. Yeah. Go. Did you get the control? Yeah, yeah, I got the control. Okay. So, so the uh, question was how. Uh, uh, ready surgeons are to adopt new, uh, new technologies and is cost being a major factor in that? Um, so I see a slight uh, difference between the metro cities as well as the uh, other uh, towns and district places uh, where the technology, though it is available, unless it is affordable to the uh, entire uh, patient population, uh, there is less investment in newer technologies and uh, probably affordability is the key to decide whether to uh, engage in new technology or not. Uh, that is one aspect. Second is uh, the uh, the journey or the uh, how much far you are ahead in your professional career, uh, whether you have reached a, a stage where you feel that uh, I can't learn anymore or whether you are still with the open mindset that age is no bar, I can still pick this up. I'm already doing uh, open laparoscopic robotic. Let me also learn endoscopic procedures. So it's also the personality and the mindset of each and every uh, surgeon involved as well. Right, right. So it does have, uh, it's uh, it's both facing uh, cost for the patient and uh, your own experience and how do you want to actually get trained for new technologies. I get the point. Uh, Dr. Alok, uh, uh, you showed a slide where Indians do use technology very often for personal usage, but professionally technology ka use bahut kam ho raha hai in India, like you said. So, uh, do you think uh, this drive for uh, digital drive for in healthcare will be driven by the uh, patients or doctor driven? Do you really think that patients will actually be the change makers over here? No, I don't think either party. I think it's a third party. I think the real delivery comes from aggregators like you or probably insurance companies. So because uh, doctors focus is more on clinical care. There are trials which show that a technology, I'll deviate from the topic, there is a lot of data now which was put in an RSS, the uh, ADA conference 2016 when I was in New Orleans. You know, so Dr. Ambadi Ram, Ramchandran has done this wonderful study where communication of glucose values on SMS has actually brought HbA1c down by one without increasing the number of medicines. So that's a big achievement. So I do a lot of CGM. I've just published my CGM data in the EDA last two years. I have shown a lot of changes in the outcome of the patient because of glycemic variability control because of CGM. Now, these technologies do not get implemented either from the medical uh, healthcare provider side or the patient side unless, you know, the need is seen. So unless aggregators and insurance companies and uh, protocols are in place, there will not be mass adoption. Few people can adopt, depending on their, uh, their, 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 their passion for technology. But unless there is a mass need generation created by some third parties, I don't see a revolutionary change happening. And all the changes which have happened now, see, COVID was responsible for pushing both the parties into technology. It was a necessity, so they had to come. But Dr. Nil Manish showed us, right, see, that's a therapy. Healthcare providers are using that therapy of technology because that becomes a part of therapy. It is a newer mode of therapy and it has shown results. So they are forced to use it. How many patients will come and tell Dr. Manish, yeah, I want this kind of newer therapy and technology based it on? How many patients will come and tell me, hey, Dr. Modi, don't do physical consultation, I want only teleconsultation. So unless somebody makes both parties realize that hey, this is the way forward, I don't think there would be mass adoption. Right, right. And I do believe that uh, those passing of the telemedicine guidelines was a big push, at least in the telemedicine part of uh, digital medicine. So yeah, regulatory bodies also, besides insurance parties and uh, tech companies, regulatory bodies need to step in. 
and ensure that uh, the benefits of technology uh, permeate throughout the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, one more question to you, Dr. Alok, because I will be having you on the screen. So, uh, what kind of uh, parameters do you think doctors would be able to track for patients beyond the clinic? Well, you talked about ECG, you talked about some uh, you know, uh, temperature monitoring sensors and all those sensors. What are the basic parameters do you think the doctor should be monitoring remotely for his patients, at least if not now, in the future? Uh, so that depends on the patient profile. If you're looking for an arrhythmia, you have water monitoring available. Today, a uh, lot of us are using APP, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for our patients. Where we monitor a lot of blood pressure patients for 48 hours with ambulatory blood pressure and we can, in fact, that has helped me cut down the medicines. You know. I've actually stopped medicines for certain uh, patients who are taking, people at a younger age were put on certain drugs, I stopped them. Lifestyle modification, ambulatory blood pressure showed, so it uh, depends on the patient profile. The basic uh, vitals, you know, like blood pressure, sugars, oxygen saturation, pulse, that probably goes hand to hand for any disease. But if you're looking at a COVID patient, the spectrum would be different. If you're looking at a heart attack patient, the spectrums would be different. If you're looking at the thyroid patient, the spectrums would be different. It, it, it changes a lot depending on the profile. So you can't make a, a common rule, you know. But probably they would capsule and they would run across the body. And everything. I don't think that days, those days are far. Maybe those days will come. And uh, Dr. Manish may not like it, but uh, today we are getting a lot of GLP bonus in place and the reference to bilateral surgery is reduced because of the recent molecules. We are getting wonderful results. SGLT2 inhibitors are giving wonderful results. Uh, a lot of cardiologists are doing fantastic two lumen and three lumen plasties. And a lot of cardiovascular surgeries, cabbage that we used to do has actually come down drastically. So the ecosystem changes very drastically depending on what technology is available. Uh, you know, this will also answer your first question. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I like to talk a lot. But, you know, your fit pants I have, they pass smart watches I have. They not come because people are crazy for fitness. If that was the case, the number of diabetics would not increase. The number of obese patients would not increase. It's the other way around. People are not interested in uh, lifestyle measures. They are not. They're going to the gym is not the reason they're going to the gym for lifestyle. They're going to the gym for various other reasons. The Fit Pants, the Apple Watch, Samsung Watch, they have been pushed by the technology companies to boost their sales. They have created an aura around it and people are buying it. And because of that, people are taking care of their health. It's not the other way around. The health has prompted patients to buy the watches. It is a tech company which is pushing the watches down your throat. Mm. So it's your third party which will push technology down the patient's throat and the doctor's throat. I don't think they will adopt technology thinking that their te technology will change them for better. Okay. Uh, fair enough. I think uh, you That's have a right. very strong point over there. Uh, a very strong and unique point because most people take it patient driven or maybe healthcare driven, but yeah, you have a very strong point there. Uh, talking about Star Trek, Dr. Manish, you know, one thing was always very interesting to me, you know, thinking that my surgeon who, when I'm Bangalore, my I'm doing a surgery in London for two hours, then I shift do a surgery in Africa, then I shift do a surgery in US. So do you think this after 5G comes and then this kind of a robotic surgery, transcontinental will really be a common, maybe in four or five years? There's nothing which is impossible and there's only things which are going to get better and better. The robotic uh, uh, surgery that we do uh, currently is all being mapped. Each surgeon's uh, uh, way of doing the procedure is being mapped and they are all, all the data points at different points of the surgery are being uh, analyzed and they are all getting stored and as the number of procedures happen all across the globe, they will have a consolidated data for each procedure that these are the common methods or common techniques or common movement of the arms that is going to happen. And there is going to be a possibility that the robotic arms themselves can start doing those uh, small procedures and uh, a pilot study can happen in that form uh, in the new, near future itself. Whether or not the robot will do the entire operation is uh, difficult to predict now. Uh, but it is going to happen that uh, we could remotely do surgeries in different parts of the world, having access to something uh, uh, unique as a robotic platform or a similar uh, AI uh, or a 
uh, augmented reality platform very interesting to dr manish i asked about robotic surgery that you really showed us that you could actually program these robots to be able to do at least the minor surgeries part of it independently excellent i would love to see that feature as soon as possible so uh, these were the questions i had i, I know we have already shot up uh, beyond our time so uh, thank you dr modi and thank you dr manish for your time and this very interesting talk uh, we would like to do more workshops around these topics with you and other doctors in the future and we'll definitely do that if you can give us the time for that uh, i would like to thank the audience again once again uh, for being with us for the past one and a half hours do fill in the feedback the feedback uh, form is shared in the chat please do fill in the feedback and thank you for attending thank you doctors for your time thanks a lot thank you again thank you thank you thank you thank you dr manish it was an honor to share the platform with no, you it was interesting you, i enjoyed your talk thank you sir thank you very much it was equally interesting thank you dr nilesh for giving me this opportunity and thanks to the vast audience it was lovely connecting to you virtually it's one sided i can't see you <laughs> so take care all the best bye bye